we're, we're continuing today in the book of Acts. And so if you want to go ahead and power on or turn in your Bible, we're going to be in Acts chapter 13. And what I want to do today is I want to talk about a question that I see in this passage, and we're going to see it really throughout the rest of the book of Acts. We've talked about a number of questions so far because the early church is struggling and working their way through so much of what it means to be the people of God. What we're going to see today is a question that is going to echo for the rest of the book. And we're going to see this question addressed in a number of different ways by a number of different people. And the question is this, who gets picked? Who gets picked? Now, we, we, we're familiar with this question because this is a question that we've dealt with since elementary school, right? Who gets picked, right? When you're, when you're divvying up teams and everybody's in the pool and you get the captains and they start picking who they want, who gets picked, right? That's something we're familiar with. You know, when you start dating, right? Who gets picked? Who gets asked out? When you start moving toward marriage, who gets picked? When you start applying for jobs, who gets picked? When you start applying for the next job, who gets picked? And, and this is something that, that we see throughout our lives in a lot of different contexts, in a lot of different ways. But when it comes to the church, when it comes to how we operate as the church, that's, that's a different question. Who gets picked? This is really dark, isn't it? I don't know why. I'm gonna blame the bathrooms. That's, that's everything for the next two weeks. It's just, it's going to be the bathroom's fault. Um, I don't know why that's so dark, but we'll figure it out. Um, the, the question about who gets picked has to do with who gets to be included and who doesn't. Who's welcome and who isn't, right? Who's invited and who isn't? powerful question, and it's one we're going to look at in chapter 13. So join with me as we jump in to chapter 1. Now, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. I want to stop right there and tell you that I almost made this particular message into three messages because there's so much in this passage, but we're gonna do it in one. So I hope you packed a lunch. No, just, just kidding. Uh, the, the prophets and teachers piece of this is interesting because we haven't seen a lot of prophets in the New Testament, right? This is an Old Testament idea. And typically when we talk about prophets, what most people think of is people who can tell the future, people who can tell you what's going to happen. That is one aspect of prophecy, but it is not typically biblical prophecy. Biblical prophets did something different. What biblical prophets were responsible for was being the voice of God to the people, explaining to them what God had already said, reminding them of what he had said in the past and what he had done in the past and what matters to him. That was the job of a prophet. Something like 92% of all prophecy in the scriptures, all the Old and New Testament, 92% of the prophecies are simply reminding people of what God has said. They're not telling you what's going to happen. Make sense? So in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and there were teachers. A prophet is a, a one who's going to speak clearly, boldly, who's not going to hold back. He's going to tell you what God says. He's going to tell you what God has done. A teacher is one who's going to explain who's going to unpack it, who's going to say, okay, now let's, let's talk about what this, mean, what this meant then, let's talk about what this means now, right? And so you can make an argument that there are still prophets and teachers in the church today, right? I fall more in the latter camp. I'm more of a teacher. I'm going to explain it to you. I'm going to unpack it. And that's what you see in the church at Antioch. You see both prophets and teachers. And then you have these five names listed, and we're going to unpack them in just a little bit because those five names are really important. The first one, and I think they're listed, typically in Scripture you see names listed in the order that they're in because of the order of importance. So the most important people are listed first. Barnabas is listed first. Now, we've already met Barnabas. Barnabas was introduced to us. His name means son of encouragement. Right? He is one who came along and stood up for the Apostle Paul, whose name was Saul at this point. 
right? And he stood up for him to the church. The church was, everybody was afraid of him. They thought he was, you know, coming in as a spy. He was gonna like take down the church from within. And Barnabas stood up for Saul. And that has always stood out to me as something that I think each one of us should be mindful of. Who can we stand up for? Who can we stand up for? Who maybe other people are running down. Maybe other people are afraid of. Maybe other people are, are, are shying away from. Who can we stand up for? Who can we stand with? That's what Barnabas did. Barnabas is listed first. Then you have these other three. And then we get to Saul at the end. And Saul is there at Antioch now. We haven't seen Saul for a bit, but this is where he's landed. And this church at Antioch is going to be incredibly influential in the New Testament. This is an incredibly influential church. This church, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Now Cyprus is where Barnabas is from. So he's going back to his old stomping grounds, right? His hometown. That's why they started there, I think. When they had arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John to assist them. We've seen John already. This is not John, the son of Zebedee, who followed Jesus. This is John Mark, right? And John Mark is the one who later on, we're going to see is going to write a biography of Jesus we know is the gospel of Mark. So John Mark is with them. So you got Saul, you got Barnabas, and you got John Mark. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar Jesus. This is interesting because this is one of the first times we've seen the name Jesus outside of, well, Jesus. But this was an incredibly common name. There were a whole lot of people running around named Jesus. Bar means son of in Aramaic. So whoever this guy was, he was the son of a man named, but not that Jesus. There's a whole lot of Jesuses, okay? In fact, you might remember when Jesus is on trial, right? And he's standing there before Pilate and Pilate offers to release a prisoner as was done at this time of year. He offers another prisoner. Do you remember the name of that prisoner? Barabbas. Barabbas. You know what Barabbas' other name was? Jesus. His other name was Jesus, Jesus Barabbas. And so what the crowd is being asked to choose between is two Jesuses. Very common name. This magician that they come upon, a Jewish false prophet named Bar Jesus, son of Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for that's the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. So you've got this leader, this proconsul, this Roman, who wants to hear more about this whole Jesus thing, wants to hear, and so he asks for Saul and Barnabas to come. Hey, come, tell me about this guy. But the magician, who's kind of his right-hand assistant, is like, no, 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 you don't want to listen to them, right? And he sought to turn this proconsul, Sergius Paulus, away from the faith. Now, how do you think Barnabas and Saul feel about that? If they're trying to share the good news about Jesus and somebody is actively opposing them, not too good. Not too good. Saul, who was also called Paul the first time we see this name, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. This is the magician, Elymas, bar Jesus. If Paul looks intently at you, and you will see this later in the New Testament, you need to, you need to step back a few steps, right? Because Paul is an intense guy. Paul looks intently at him and said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, which I think is really one of the best phrases that we need to capture and pull into common usage, right? Like if you want something to say to somebody, you want to like tell them like, this is it right here, right? Son of the devil, enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy. And villainy is an underused word. 
I think we need to bring this one back. Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? So Paul had just finished reading How to Win Friends and Influence People <laughs> and was leveraging his newfound skills in working with people as he did this. No, Paul's not holding back. Paul is not operating in a handcuffed manner here. No holds barred. And now, Paul said, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. How was it for Saul when he met Jesus? What happened to him right after that? And then what happened? And Ananias came and he could see. Is it possible for somebody to, when they can't see, to have greater clarity than when they can? I think this was Saul's experience and I think this is what is going on here. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. This is Bar-Jesus, Elymas, the magician. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. And that's where we're going to stop today. This is a fascinating passage for a lot of reasons. And I want to I walk through and unpack it just a little bit. What, what's going on here from chapter 13 on, we have seen up to this point kind of a back and forth between the apostles in Jerusalem, Peter, James, John, and Paul or Saul up to this point. Back and forth, back and forth. From this point on, Saul or Paul is going to dominate the book of Acts. And what they are on, this trip they are on, when they were sent out from Antioch, this is the beginning of what's going to be called Paul's first missionary journey. This is the beginning of that. And that's what we're going to see. Paul's first missionary journey, note, did not result from a planning session, but from the Spirit's initiative as the leaders worshiped. Don't miss that. This wasn't like we're being strategic and we're going to say, Jesus said, you know, in concentric circles and we're going to move here and we're going to move here. No, the Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work I've called them to as they are worshiping. And so they did. This first missionary journey of Paul is going to take three years. Remember, there's no mass transportation. This is by foot or by boat. It's going to take three years. It's captured in our Bibles in chapters 13 and 14. But it's really easy to think if we're just going to read two chapters that didn't take all that long because this is, this is telescoped, right? This, this, is, this, this seems like it doesn't take that long, but this is going to take three years from start to stop. And what we're seeing here is the beginning of that first missionary journey, right? They get to this point, they come before this Roman leader, this Gentile, He's not Jewish. Sergius Paulus is a Latin name. They come before him and they share the good news about Jesus. Now for us, this is not a big deal. But remember, we've seen so far in Acts what a tension there is between people who are firmly convinced that God is only for the Jewish people and everybody else, well, they, they, don't, they don't get included. And those who think that God is for everybody, that God's whole intent and purpose going back to Genesis chapter 12 was that all nations would be blessed. All nations, everybody gets invited to the table. And this tension between these two groups is gonna continue. And what we're seeing here is that Barnabas and Saul have no tension in them. They are operating completely according to the second group, that we believe the good news of Jesus is for everybody and we want everybody to come home. We want everybody to be included. We want everybody to be picked because we believe God has picked them. No matter where they are, no matter what, where they've been, no matter what they've done. And this is radical and this is revolutionary. And as is so often the case with radical and revolutionaries, particularly in the church, they're gonna get called on the carpet for it in chapter 15. They're going to get called back to Jerusalem and they're going to have to stand before the council, the religious leaders in Jerusalem in the church and have to account for what they've done. But they are going all in. 
They are going to stand before Sergius Paulus and they're going to say, hey, we want to tell you about Jesus because we want you as part of the family. And that is so absolutely revolutionary. Those names that I listed earlier, the five names that were in the church in Antioch, this was their leaders. This was the prophets and the teachers. This was their leadership team. We would use the language today. And the leadership team, this plurality of gifted leaders has geographical, cultural, and ethnic diversity. And this is striking and it becomes a mark of the Christian movement. If you look down that list, you see people who have Jewish names. You see people who do not. You see Roman names, Latin names. You see Jews, you see Gentiles, you see poor, you see wealthy, you see people who are very schooled in religious ways like Saul, and you see people who are not. And they're all part of this leadership team. And there is such a diversity among this plurality of gifted leaders. And this is one of the places that I will often point to when people ask, why is Southview, why does Southview, why is Southview led by a plurality of leaders? Why is it not led by just one person? Because everywhere I see in the New Testament, you see a church, you see it led by elders, plural. You know why? Because no one person has all the spiritual gifts. No one. There's something like two dozen spiritual gifts that are enumerated in the New Testament. I have three. If you are dependent on me to have the other 21, you are in trouble because I don't have them. That's not how God gifted me. But if you look around our elder table, you find a whole lot of different gifts, a whole lot of different perspectives. And that is the beauty of a plurality of gifted leaders, particularly one that is diverse. As you're thinking about how do we make sure that we have all the gifts or as many as we can represented around the table? How can we make sure we have a lot of different perspectives, not just one? That is, well, healthy. And I would argue that is biblical. No one person has all the gifts and no one person gets it right all the time. Doesn't happen. You don't, I don't. That's why we have a team. And we get this in one, from, from one place here in Acts. We see this, this team led the church from a place of diversity and a place of giftedness. And this was striking. This was not normal in this day. This was not something they saw in the culture around them and they copied and they brought in. This was incredibly countercultural. And so the church has always been, or has always been intended to be. It's when we begin to stop being different. It's when we begin to, to stop being distinctive that we begin to lose some of the light and the salt that Jesus described us as. We begin to lose some of that power. What's happening at Antioch is organized outreach to the Gentiles. That's what's going on here. They're going to Cyprus. They're going on around the island. What's going on here? They're, they're beginning an outreach, a very intentional outreach to people who are not Jewish. Sergius Paulus. Well, wait a minute, is that okay? Don't we have to have permission to do that? I think, I think Barnabas and Saul operated like many of us, which is when God says to do something, I'm just gonna ask forgiveness later of somebody else if they have a problem with it. I'm gonna follow what Jesus is saying here. And this is what they're doing. They're gonna run and they're going to run hard after this goal. They want the message of Jesus carried to everyone. Amen. It's astounding. And it's unusual. You do not see another instance of this yet at this point in history. This is the first one. A New Testament scholar named Peter Barnes says it this way. He says, what happened to Bar Jesus is an appropriate attention getter for someone who tried to blind others to the truth of God's word. Bar Jesus is, is the blindness that is temporarily put upon him is an illustration. It's an object lesson, if you will. You wanna blind other people to the truth of scripture? You wanna blind other people to what God is doing? Well, you're gonna be blind for a season. You're not gonna see. And the question that, that we might come to if we're honest when we come to this text is, is Paul being too harsh here? 
I mean, I, I was laughing about what he said, but I mean, that's kind of harsh, if we're honest. That's kind of harsh. I mean, would we use that kind of a language? You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy. We, we, we're doing a training for our first impressions team this afternoon. And, and that's not language that we encourage our first impressions team to use as you walk up. We, we don't encourage that. Why? Well, it's, it's a little harsh. <laughs> Is Paul being too harsh here? If we're honest, we have to be honest with the questions that we ask. And sometimes we come to the text and maybe we try to ignore those questions. We, we try to think those questions aren't godly or spiritual. But I think we should be honest because God is big enough for our questions. Is Paul being too harsh here? I mean, speaking to this guy like this and then blinding him. Well, there's a couple of things that I want to point out. Ajith Fernando says it this way. He says, Bar Jesus was trying to keep someone else from learning the way of salvation. How big of a deal is that? I'm going to keep you from being right with God. I'm going to keep you from hearing about Jesus through all kinds of deceit and trickery. The salvation of Sergius Paulus was so valuable that this hindrance had to be rooted out. How important is Sergius? How valuable is he? Well, that depends on who you ask. Remember the two groups I talked about earlier? If you think that God is only for the Jewish people and everybody else, not so much, then how valuable is Sergius Paulus? Not much. But if you think God's for everybody, that he wants everybody to come home, or as, we, as we'll read later in the New Testament, that his desire is for all people to come to a knowledge of the truth, for all people to be saved. If that's true, then how valuable is Sergius Paulus? Quite. Well, are you gonna act according to how valuable you see someone? Of course we do, of course we do. We talk to people based on their value. We treat people based on their value. Harsh? Perhaps. True? Yes. And part of the problem in the way people talk to one another in our day is that they do not see value in another person's perspective or opinion. And sometimes they don't even see value in the other person. And this is a problem. And as followers of Jesus, we have to be clear. What does scripture say about this? Well, if you go all the way back, you go all the way back to Genesis, what does it say? It says that every person who's created is created in the image of God. Every person. You've never locked eyes with another person who's not created in the image of God. No matter how they act, no matter how they dress, no matter how they think, no matter how they speak. They're created in the image of God. And that's how we treat them. With that kind of valuable. How valuable is a person created in the image of God? I would argue pretty valuable. Ergo, what's going on here, Sergius Paulus is so valuable that Paul's like, this cannot stand. I will not allow anything or anyone to stand in the way of this guy coming home to Jesus. I will not allow it. And I will do whatever it takes. But what's going on in Sergius Paulus' mind? Sergius is listening to this this whole thing about Jesus, but he's also listening to Bar Jesus, who's been talking to him for a long time, right? Telling him all this stuff. There's multiple ways, there's multiple paths, there's multiple truths. This was a very Roman idea that there are multiple paths, multiple truths. And this is the roots of what we today would call pluralism. And pluralism mandates that since there is no absolute truth, that different ideologies are all equal. And this was a very Roman idea. The problem, of course, is that Jesus taught that there is only one way to God through him. Amen. That's it. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Well, you can't have both of those things be true. Pluralism cannot be true if what Jesus said is true. You have to pick one. They're exclusive. 
And this is what is happening in Roman culture and what is going to begin to happen as the church begins to take these, these steps. And this movement that was called the way, as it begins to gain influence, as it begins to gain understanding among the people, they realize pretty quickly what this means. Only one way means only one God. And Rome was a very pluralistic place. Many, many, many gods. Well, this is why, this explains why in the early church, the early Christians, these followers of the way, were called by the Romans atheists because they didn't believe in all the gods. They're atheists. They only believe in one. This is the crux of what's happening inside Sergius Paulus right now. Do I follow what I've been taught my whole life? That there are many ways, many paths, and they're all really equal. Or what Barnabas and Saul are saying. This Jesus, that he is the way, and there is no other. Now, Paul is going to take this message and he's going to carry this message way beyond where a lot of people thought he should have. There were a whole lot of people in that day who didn't think Paul had any business talking to a Roman about this. Not a Gentile. Because he doesn't matter. But Paul is going to carry that message to everybody. Even to a Roman proconsul, a leader. And just like with Bar-Jesus, Bar-Jesus is one of the first, but he will not be the last who will oppose this. He will not be the last who will try to stand in the way of this. And that was true then, and it's true now. Uh, one of my favorite scholars, N.T. Wright, says this. He says, when a new work of God is going ahead, you can expect opposition, difficulty, problems, and confrontation. This is normal. Notice it doesn't say comfortable. But it's normal. When you begin to talk about Jesus as the only way, which is what he said, when you begin to talk about one way, one truth, one life, you will face all of these things. You will face opposition, difficulty, problems, and confrontation because people do not like that. And bar Jesus was just the first. Just the first that we're going to see. He will not be the last. Richard Longenecker, another New Testament scholar, says the conversion of Sergius Paulus was a turning point in Paul's whole ministry and inaugurated a new policy in the mission to Gentiles. The legitimacy of a direct approach to and full acceptance of Gentiles apart from any distinctive Jewish stance. They did not have to become Jewish first. They can come and be part of the church as they are. This is what Luke clearly sets forth as the great innovative development of the first missionary journey. This is groundbreaking. And Paul's leading the charge. And the message the message is so simple and is one that we still talk about today. And you've heard it in this room if you've been here for a while many times. That is this, the gospel, that is the good news about Jesus, that's for all people. Everywhere. Everybody. Even Romans. Even Romans get to be a part of this. And even Gentiles. Even Gentiles get to come in. This, this, again, can feel very simplistic and like, yeah, yeah, we already know all this, but I can't tell you how revolutionary this was in the first century. This was not how people thought. This was not how they behaved. This was not supposed to be how religion worked. But as he did throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus kind of blew up the boxes of religion and started something new. 
And that new community that is made up of people of all different perspectives and all different races and all different cultures where everybody gets a seat at the table and everybody is seen as valuable in the eyes of God and of each other. That new community, that's what we still have today. That's why this is so important. There's a song that I've been listening to. I just, I just heard it not long ago. It's called The God Who Stays by Matthew West. I don't know if any of you have heard this. There's a part of it that I just love. You are the God who stays. You're the one who runs in my direction. The one who runs in my direction. Because I matter. When the whole world walks away, you're the God who stands with wide open arms. And you tell me nothing I've ever done can separate my heart from the God who stays. My shame can't separate. My guilt can't separate. My past can't separate. I'm yours forever. That's the good news. That's the good news of Jesus. That is what Barnabas and Paul are bringing to Sergius Paulus. That is what he hears and he gets invited into. And he says, yes, not because of what Paul does to bar Jesus, not because of the blindness. Miracles are always only an authentication of the message. And if you look at the text, what does it say? The proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Why would he be so astonished? Because this type of message is one he'd never heard before. That you're invited, that you matter, that you're included, that you have a heavenly father who wants you. That no matter where you've been or what you've done, you're invited to the table. If you heard that for the first time, how would you feel? Astonished, I think might be the right word. And so he was. And he believed, and he is a Gentile who is now gonna be part of this new movement. And he will not be the last. And we will see so many Gentiles in the days ahead who will come, become part of this new movement called the way, the church. We'll see so many Gentiles that, like I said, in chapter 15, Barnabas and Saul are gonna get called on the carpet for it. They're gonna have to go back to the mother church in Jerusalem and answer for this. And that's a conversation I can't wait to get to because that's my favorite chapter in the entire book of Acts. I want you to make sure that no matter what else you walk away with, I wanna make sure you walk away with this. The good news about Jesus is for everybody. No matter your past, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, the gospel of Jesus is for you. You are invited. You have a heavenly father who knows everything about you and invites you because he wants you to come home. Don't miss that. And if you understand that and you've grabbed onto that and accepted that, then be a conduit of that message. How you treat others matters. How you speak to them matters. How you love them matters. As Jesus said, this is how people will know that you're my followers if you love one another. What greater love is there than this, than to share this type of message with people who when they hear it are simply astonished. Just like Sergius. This is my prayer for you. We are in a, a very interesting season in our country, in our area, and in our world. A very interesting season where division is prevalent everywhere, where people want to divide, and the church has a different message. And you and I get to share that. So my challenge to you is to be a conduit of that message this message, the message that Barnabas and Saul shared with Sergius Paulus so long ago and that people around you need to hear too. And for many of them, the only way they're gonna hear it is if you share it, if you are that conduit. So I challenge you, 
Be open to what God wants to do in you and through you for the benefit of those around you. And experience what it means to be used by God. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we leave this this section of Acts, that we understand this truth, that the good news about Jesus is for everybody, not just one group, not just for people who might think or act like we do. Father, I pray that we would that we would be mindful of this every day as we interact with others. That we would communicate with them in such a way that we communicate their value. That can be really hard, particularly if we disagree. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, I believe you enable each one of us to do just that. And so this is my prayer, that we would be conduits of your love, that we would be conduits of your message of hope and acceptance. And I pray this in the name of Jesus for every one of us. Amen.